our Bibles tonight and go to Ephesians chapter 5. So Ephesians chapter 5 will be in verses 15 through 19. So Ephesians chapter 5, verses 15 through 19. The Bible says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Wherefore, be ye not unwise, but understanding what the will of the Lord is. And be not drunk with wine, wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Father, we do thank you this evening that we can be gathered together. We do thank you for the songs that we sung. I do pray, Lord, that you would minister to our hearts tonight, guiding us according to your will. Lord, helping us to draw closer to you each and every day, of our lives that you've given us. Father, we ask that you would glorify yourself, for it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Tonight I want to talk to us about living wisely, and we find several truths in these verses tonight that will point to a life that is being lived wisely, the life of a Christian uh, who is allowing the Word of God and the wisdom of God to guide them and direct them. In James chapter 1 and verse 5, the Bible says, If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. Again, we have said often that the Christian life cannot be lived outside of Christ. We cannot make any impact in the Christian life without allowing the Lord Jesus Christ to make an impact in our life. And we do need the wisdom of God to help us in these days to continue walking with him not being discouraged with things we hear or see, but to continue to be encouraged in our walk with the Lord as truly God's will for each of us is to draw closer to Him and to become more like Christ. And in these passages tonight, we find that there are three types of walks that God wants us to have. In verse 15, it says, See then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. God calls us to have a wise walk. Again, this is nothing that we can do by ourselves, but it is adhering to God's will. It is submitting ourselves to the Holy Spirit as the Holy Spirit has been given a ministry to fulfill in the life that will be yielded to Him. Again, we are called to have a wise walk, and to have a wise walk is to be aware to have awareness in our life of the surroundings around us that would hinder us from having a wise walk and those who would hinder us from walking in wisdom. Now, the Bible says we are to walk circumspectly and to remind us of the word circumspectly and what it means. It means to look on all sides, to truly watch carefully, to guard against danger or surprise, to look exactly, accurately, and diligently all around us for anything that could cause us to fall, to stumble, or to be led astray. God wants us to be aware of the surroundings around us, what it is that we allow into our life, what it is that could cause uh, the theology, using that term, the theology that we have learned through God's Word, to be corrupted. Again, the devil is alive and well. The devil wants to change the thinking of God's people to cause God's people to become, um, I guess, relaxed in their life, relaxed in their spiritual warfare, as Ephesians chapter 6 gives us the armor that we are supposed to put on and keep on on a daily basis because we are in a spiritual battle with an enemy that we cannot see. But we're not ignorant of his devices. We know that he uses different things in this world to cause the Christian to fall from their steadfastness. But God calls us to have a wise walk, being aware of our surroundings, being aware of things that could hinder our walk with the Lord and hinder us from being faithful unto the Lord, but also people. Also be aware of people who could hinder you as well. In Ephesians chapter 5, verse 11, it says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. Remember, Jesus had made the statement that he did not commit himself unto men because he knew what was in man. 
Again, God wants us to be salt and light in this world. He wants us to be a godly, Christ-like influence in people's lives. We want people to know that they do have a friend in us if they choose to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. But we got to be careful that, again, the devil does plant tares among the wheat. Again, the devil is always looking to root up, tear down, and destroy God's people one by one. And the best way to do it, the best way for a predator to have advantage over the prey is to separate them from the flock, to separate them from the herd. If you've ever watched uh, documentaries on predators, different ones, lions and such, even, even wolves, you know, they, they watch a herd, they're looking for the weak link. They're looking for the one in the herd or in the flock that's kind of weak, and he'll, uh, the predator will try to get that herd moving, and then once they get scared and they start running, he chases the one that lags behind. He chases the one that doesn't stay with the group but kind of goes off in a different direction, and that one becomes an easy prey for the predator. The devil does the same thing in your life and my life. He uses things, he uses people to try to get us off course, to get us to veer away from protection, because the Bible says there is wisdom in a multitude of counselors. You understand that when you have a group of people that are locked together in their thinking, in their desires, when they are when they have a common goal, as the Bible tells us, to be Christ-minded, that we are to be unified, that the devil has a harder time distracting one person and getting them out of the group or out of the flock when they are committed together. But if you've ever watched a school of fish uh, swimming, even, even if you've gone in and you've seen just a school of minnows, I mean, they just kind of are synchronized in their swimming, right? Uh, even even uh, locusts and grasshoppers, that there's a, there's a bunch of them. They just seem to be, you know, synchronized in everything that they do, right? God wants us to be synchronized as a body of believers so that, you know what, we're mindful, we are aware, we're watching for one another. We're watching for the enemy who wants to, you know, take a child, take a teenager, take a young person, lead them astray. Again, not everyone's going to listen to you, not everyone's going to uh, take wise counsel, but at least we have the opportunity to have a wise walk that we are aware of our surroundings, which means we're aware of the culture we live in. We are aware of society. We are aware of certain people, you know, that would be used of the devil to destroy our testimony, even destroy our faith. And all it takes is a question to cause a child of God to veer away from the truth. The devil is very good at posing questions that really can destroy somebody's faith because he did it in the Garden of Eden, did he not? He simply said, yea, if God said. He just questioned what the Lord had told Adam and Eve. And when they thought about it, when Eve thought about it, she, she decided that God was wrong, the devil was right, and she, she took of the fruit willingly, but she did not completely trust the Lord. She allowed somebody to change her thinking. Again, the devil wants to change our thinking on the truth of God's word. He wants us to change our thinking on the faithfulness of God. He wants us to be changed in our thinking and in our resolve that God is always right. God's not a man that he should lie. All right? I'm not always right. Sometimes I'm wrong in the things that I, I think because I'm human. But God is always right. God's never wrong. And the devil is using people and he uses different things in our lives to try to cultivate a mindset that is contrary to the Lord. We have to be aware of our surroundings. Be aware of things in your life. Again, uh, whether it's people, again, God calls us to be salt and light. But if you know that there is somebody or a group of people that is anti-Christ, why would you even ask them for advice? Why would you even go to them to ask them any godly advice? They're not going to give you advice according to God's word. They're not going to be led 
by the Spirit of God, right? But also, we want to make sure that our hearts are not turned from God with complaining and murmuring and disputings because of an outsider who has affected our heart. The Bible says, Have no fellowship with the unfruitful works of darkness, but rather reprove them. In Philippians chapter 2, the Bible says, Do all things without murmurings and disputings, that ye may be blameless and harmless as sons of God without rebuke, in the midst of a crooked and perverse nation, among whom ye shine as lights in the world, holding forth the word of life, that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain, neither labored in vain. God wants us to be aware of our surroundings. He wants us to have that wise walk that is aware and that also is full of light. Our wise walk being full of light. In John 16, verse 13, How be it when he, the Spirit of truth, is come, speaking of the Holy Spirit, he will guide you into all truth, for he shall not speak of himself, but whatsoever he shall hear, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. He shall glorify me, for he shall receive of mine, and shall show it unto you. Now let me just, as I'm thinking about this, let me just back up and, and just clarify. When I say that we don't need to be around people that are anti-Christ, they're against the Lord, they don't believe in the Lord, Again, God's not calling us to disown any family members, all right? But again, you've got to be aware that the things they say that are not Christ-like, that not, does not encourage you in the Lord, should not be taken to heart. Again, we are to take to heart the things that are true, the things that do lift up the Lord Jesus Christ and glorify the Lord, because when we walk in the light as he is in the light, we'll have fellowship with the Lord. We will see things that are true and we'll see things that are not true. Again, it's not about everybody else and how they're living. It's about you living wisely. You having a wise walk with the Lord. You walking in light as you are a child of the light. We have been called out of darkness and the spirit of truth has been given to you and to me to guide us into all truth. But not only does God want us to have a wise walk, but look at verse 16. He wants us to have a redeeming walk. He says, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. You and I only have one opportunity to make things right with God in living our life for the Lord. No second chances. Once this life is over, that's it. Again, we're not perfect. God understands that we're human. God understands that we'll make mistakes, but he wants our hearts to be fixed upon him. He wants us to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, always moving forward because he wants us to take every opportunity we have to live for him daily. Again, we only get one opportunity, redeeming the time. Go to Psalm chapter 90. Psalm chapter 90. Again, seizing every opportunity that God gives us. So what's redeeming mean? Seizing the opportunity. And the psalmist says in Psalm 90, verse 10 and 12, The days of our years are threescore years and ten. And if by reason of strength they be fourscore years, eighty years, yet is their strength labor and sorrow. For it is soon cut off and we fly away. So teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Again, we understand that time is but a vapor. We understand that we don't have long on this earth. Again, if, if someone lives to be 80, 90, even 100 years old, it is but a speck on the timeline that God has. I mean, once this life is over, it's over. There's probably been times in your life, I know there has been times in my life, where I regretted not having done something. The time has passed. I can't get that time back. And God wants us to be wise in redeeming the time every day, taking the opportunity every day to yield our life to him, to let God work in our life, to let the Lord use us, and for us to be used of the Lord 
in this life that he has given us. Jesus never wasted a moment when he was walking on this earth. Even when he was tired, even when he was hungry, yet when he saw the people, he had compassion and he served them. He taught them. There are times where God brings somebody into your life. You get a phone call, you get a knock on the door, and though you're tired, though you want to go to bed, yet there's somebody that needs to talk, and God has brought them to you and to me. And God wants to use us in those ways. Uh, sometimes it might be as a parent taking the opportunity to teach a child something, something that is valuable, something that taking a moment to teach them the goodness of God, the faithfulness of God because of something going on in their life. Seizing the opportunity every day because I have, I have come to the realization, not just now, but as a parent and having grown children, that you know what, you don't get those years back. Once they're grown, they're grown. I mean, they're still a part of your life, but you understand some of the things that maybe you, want, you wanted to do, you can't do anymore because they're not, you know, five years old and ten years old, right? So you have to take the opportunity that God gives you on a daily basis and cherishing every day that God gives you. Psalm 118 and verse 24 says this, This is the day which the Lord hath made. We will rejoice and be glad in it. Now there's been times where we've, oh, I can't wait till tomorrow. I can't wait till next week. Uh, I've known of many. And I think of, I think of one man in my mind that uh, was, just could not wait until he retired. But his retirement brought eight years of being bedridden. With a sickness. See, people live for retirement. Oh, I can't wait till I retire. I can't wait for this. Can't. But we're not guaranteed tomorrow, right? That's why every day is a day to be cherished. Every day that you and I wake up and our eyes open and we take another breath is a day to be cherished. And it's a day for us to walk with the Lord, a day with us to be uh, an example to others, to impact others as much as we can. Redeeming the time because the days are evil. When you look at verse 18, we see the third walk, and it's a spiritual walk. And this is about living wisely with a wise walk, a redeeming walk, and a spiritual walk. In verse 18, oh, let me get back there. Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. The Bible says, And be not drunk with wine, where is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. Speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. God calls us to have a spiritual walk, and it is yielding ourselves to the Lord. In Galatians 5.16, this I say then, walk in the Spirit, and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. And again, how to walk in the Spirit is to yield yourself, to yield myself to the Holy Spirit of God, letting the Holy Spirit cultivate his fruit in our life. Again, he has a ministry to fulfill in your life and my life, and it is to cultivate his fruit, the love, the joy, the peace, the long-suffering, the temperance, the meekness, all of that that conforms us more into the image of Christ, helps us to have a testimony that speaks loud of the power of Christ in a dark, dying world that has no peace, that needs the Lord Jesus Christ. In Colossians 3.16, or actually, you know what, look at, he says in verse uh, number 18, be not drunk with wine wherein is excess. All right? How can you have a spiritual walk? And the way is to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. Now, he uses the analogy of not being drunk with wine. As adults, whether you have been, or you just know people who are, and at different times, have been under the uh, control of alcohol, they're not in their right mind. They're not, they're not able to speak clearly. They're not able to think logically. They cannot react quickly to situations. And we would think, man, they're, they're just, they're out of their mind. They have no control. Well, they're controlled by the demons of alcohol. 
They're being controlled by the demons of alcohol, and God wants us to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. To be controlled by the Holy Spirit because, you know what, if we're under the influence of the Holy Spirit, we're going to act a certain way. We're going to think a certain way. We're going to speak a certain way. We're going to treat people a certain way. But the choice is to be filled because he says, and be not drunk with wine wherein is excess, but be filled with the Spirit. And the choice that we have to make is I want to be filled with the Spirit so I can truly have a spiritual walk that is guided by the Spirit of God. Colossians 3.16 tells us, Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Singing is a wonderful thing. Whether you can sing on tune or not, it's a wonderful thing. I love to sing to the Lord. On my way to work, when I go, when I go, to, when I go to FedEx, there's, there's just different songs that I like to sing on my way to work because it helps me, even though I'm tired and really don't want to be up at that time of morning, yet it's a great opportunity to just worship God and spend time with Him for 15 minutes before I get to work. Or, you know, whether you're out in the yard, whether you're, you know, in the kitchen doing dishes or mowing the grass, whatever you're doing, whatever age you are, you and I have a great opportunity just to sing praises unto the Lord, to sing His, his thanksgiving, to sing about His goodness. But you know what? As we learn the way to walk in the Spirit, it's simply by yielding to the Holy Spirit and letting the Holy Spirit cultivate his fruit in our life and to change us into the image of Christ, it is choosing to be filled with the Spirit. Allowing, you know, even asking God to control your thoughts, to control your speech, to control your actions. Because, again, what goes in comes out. What goes in, what goes in the ear gate, what goes in the eye gate, it's going to come out the mouth. It's going to come out in our actions. Jesus said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. The issues of life are in the heart. Again, we want to be influenced by the Holy Spirit of God, not the wickedness of the devil that's in this world. That's why it's important that as Christians, we're not watching rated R movies. We're not listening to ungodly music. We're not spending all our time on social media filling our minds and hearts with all of that, and there's no room for the Holy Spirit. There's no room for the Word of God. We're not, you know, here, here, here's a litmus test. Here's a test for you and for me. If we can read the Bible and not be affected by it, if we can read the Bible and not be affected by it, that means there's too much of the world in us. There's too much of the world in us if I'm not affected by the Bible. If I can read the Bible and, and set it down and not even think about thinking about what I read, then we're too much affected by the world. Because Jesus was influenced by the Spirit. He is the Holy Spirit. He is God. When he saw people in need, his heart was to help them. If we see people in need, what does our heart say? Well, I need more help than they do. Well, I'll pray for them that somebody will help them. Again, remind us that if God shows us a need, he wants us to be the one to help. Again, we want to be influenced by the Holy Spirit. We want to have a genuine spiritual walk with the Lord, and it will take discipline it will take removing things out of our life. It will, it will, it'll be hard. I'll tell you that. It'll be hard, especially when something has been so significantly part of your life. It will be hard, but the Holy Spirit will give us the ability to lay it aside so that he can have full control over us. Here's, a, here's, another, here's another test. What do you think about the most? What occupies your mind the most? Even right now, sitting in church, what is your mind thinking about? And you might find that it's not has anything to do with the Lord. 
has something to do with you did earlier, something you're going to do this week, or you know, something you've got to take care of. Again, what is it that occupies our mind? Because here, here's the true witness of a spiritual walk. Here's a, here's a true witness of a spiritual walk. Number one, we'll speak lovingly. We'll speak graciously. Look at Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, if you would. Because if we can easily spew corrupt words out of our mouth about somebody else or to somebody else, then we don't have a genuine spiritual walk with the Lord. The fruit of the Spirit is not being cultivated in our heart because it's not a one-time cultivation. Last summer, I planted a garden, and I had some fruit from that garden. I had, I mean, the Roma tomatoes just, I mean, just came out in abundance. But guess what? It's not producing anything right now. And I had to go out there daily and, and check on it and check on the other vegetables and stuff and, and to kind of work the garden, right? doesn't work itself. you got to work the garden. you got to look for weeds, look for anything that could destroy the fruit. It's the same for the spiritual walk. In Ephesians chapter 4, verse 29, let your speech be always with grace. You know what grace is? Grace is forgiveness. Grace is patience. Grace is long-suffering. Grace is... They probably didn't mean to say that. Even if they did mean to say that, I'm not going to allow them to affect me. Another test that we could give ourselves is when somebody is harsh with us, how do we respond? When we perceive somebody is saying something to attack us, how do we respond? Remember, Jesus responded with grace. He never said a word back to his accusers. And in fact, those that would nail him to the cross, he said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. Because the, the human nature, the human tendency is to protect. Whether it's words, whether it's actions, even if it's just looks, we want to protect ourselves. Because there have been many people who have been on the receiving end of an attack because the other person perceived that they were looking at them in a bad way. Again, speaking lovingly is a witness that we are walking in the Spirit and not fulfilling the lust of the flesh, but we are fulfilling the will of God. Secondly, singing, with, singing joyfully or singing with joy. He says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. Another witness that, that can help you and me to know that you know we're on the right path, we, we're having a spiritual walk, is we find ourselves speaking more graciously, more forgiving. We're, we're speaking with words that edify and exhort instead of tearing down, but we are singing joyfully, not just going through the motions like the songs tonight. What was in your heart when you were singing the songs that we were being led to sing? At midnight, Paul and Silas prayed and sang praises unto God, and the prisoners heard them. It's not natural to want to sing praises when you're faced with difficulty, or when you're faced with car problems, a job problem, a marriage problem, financial difficulties. It's not a natural instinct to start Praising the God, oh, thank you, Lord, that my car just broke down. Thank you, Lord, that I'm having this fight with my spouse. Thank you, Lord, that I'm in the hot seat at work for something I didn't do. That's not the natural tendency, right, to rejoice. But it is what gets God's attention. It is what helps us to remain calm and focused and unmovable. Again, go, go, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Because one truth that we can always meditate upon that will help us in our spiritual walk is to remember verse 57 of 1 Corinthians 
chapter 15. But thanks be to God, which giveth us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, because of the victory that we have in Christ, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, for as much as you know that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. Your labor, whatever you do, you're trying to walk in the Spirit. You're trying to pattern your life after Christ. You're trying to let the Holy Spirit cultivate His fruit in your heart so it bears out in your life, but it seems like time and time again you might fail the test. Because there's always a test. Whether you get hot-headed and you say something you shouldn't or you think something you shouldn't or you respond in a way you shouldn't, don't give up. Again, our adversary is always there to point out our faults because he's the accuser of the brethren. He's always there to say, ah, see, you're never going to change. But yet the Lord says, hey, let's move on. Keep following me. Because what it does, it shows us where we need to work. It shows us, okay, I've got more work that needs to be done in this area. Because remember, our faith is more precious than gold to the Lord. God is all about, he predestinated us to be conformed to the image of his son. And he's not going to stop. Because he that begun the good work in you is going to finish it. He's going to accomplish his will in our life. But we can sing joyfully, and really the devil hates that. Psalm chapter 40, David says, I waited patiently for the Lord, and he inclined unto me and heard my cry. He brought me up also out of a horrible pit, out of the miry clay, and set my feet upon a rock and established my goings. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto our God. Many shall see it and fear and shall trust in the Lord. Again, as God cultivates that spiritual walk in our life and as we adhere to that spiritual walk and, and people see the joy in our life and they even maybe even hear us at times singing. Like Paul and Silas, it impacts somebody's life. That's why God wants us to have a wise walk and a redeeming walk. Every day is an opportunity to be impacted by God and to impact somebody else. Again, a parent raising children, impacting them for Christ. Co-workers, family members, spouses, I mean, it goes on and on and on. Every day is an opportunity for God to continue working in us and letting us be a witness and a testimony to those around that yeah, I might have failed yesterday, but today's a new day, and today the Lord is going to have victory in my life because I'm yielding myself to him, and I can rejoice that he has not forsaken me. He hasn't cast me aside. He hasn't given up on me. He is still working in my life, and I can live thankfully because of that. 1 Thessalonians 5.18, And everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. But we have to actually want to live wisely. We actually have to want a wise walk and a redeeming walk and a walk that witnesses and testifies of the grace of God in our life. We have to want that. And that is where we have to choose to let the Holy Spirit have his way in our life, to let him cultivate his fruit. You can't have a good marriage without the Holy Spirit of God working in at least one. I mean, it, again, it, it, it does. If you have two spouses that are walking with God, you can have a greater marriage. But if at least one's walking with God, it's better than nothing. In everything, allowing ourselves to continue seeking God wanting God to be glorified in our life, wanting Him to accomplish His will. And again, His will is for us to be more like Christ, for us to have a walk that helps us to succeed in this life. You remember the Lord told, Peter, or told Paul it was hard for him to kick against the pricks. 
he was saying, you're, you're butting heads with me. You're going in the opposite direction. And not saying you, but many Christians go in the opposite direction of the Lord, and they butt heads with the Lord, and they get mad at God because things aren't working out. That things aren't the way they want it to be, and yet they're not yielding to God's will. God's will is to bless his children. God's will is to provide for them. God's will is to help them to have a joyous and happy life and to have a life that, you know what, isn't affected by any evil in this world. It's not affected by anything that goes awry. Again, uh, I had to learn, and I still get tested on this, I had to learn to be patient with drivers that would pull out in front of me and drive slow. Or, you know, just at the last moment, they pull out and you got to slam on your brakes, right? And I'm looking. I'd always look at my rear view. There's nobody behind me. Why did they do this, right? And I would get upset. And I still get tested with it, but I think I've learned to just, okay, Maybe there's an accident God's trying to keep me from because there's been times where I've gotten down the road and there's been an accident and think, thank you, Lord, because just a few seconds earlier, that could have been me in that accident. So just always learn that, you know what? God knows what he's doing. And if something doesn't go right in a day, there's got to be a reason for it. If we know, well, I didn't do anything wrong, then you know what? There's something God wants us to learn from it. There's something that God wants to, to do in our life through that situation. Because again, God does care about you. He cares about being glorified in your life. He cares about the Holy Spirit finishing his ministry in your life, my life as well. So let's choose to live wisely in this world, and that's being conscious of our Father our Father in heaven who has a perfect will for our life. He wants to be glorified in the life that has been redeemed. He wants to be glorified in the life that's yielded to him.